Professor, I have to first of all say that it's a tremendous honor to have you here. I, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable by saying so, but you're, we cannot thank you enough for giving us your time and your contribution to science. Frankly, the more I research it, the more stunned I am. Uh, you know, hopefully that doesn't uh, make, make you blush, but would you be able to briefly explain to our audience what won you the Nobel Prize and, and how it's, um, it's influenced science and medicine? Yeah, this is uh, the stuff, discovery that won us the Nobel Prize is done way back in the 1970s. We, uh, we, we, that's me and a young Swiss colleague, I was just in my early 30s and he was a bit younger, discovered basically how some cells that are basically the hitmen of the immune system work. These are some of the white blood cells. You know, we've got red white blood cells that carry the oxygen and stuff and white blood cells that go round and round in their body. The, the white blood cells are much scarcer, but some of them are, are actually what we call CD8 T cells. T cells means they've just been processed through the thymus in our throat. But basically what they are is they're the hitmen of, immune system, of the immune system that goes around the body and bumps off cells that have gone wrong. They could be cancer cells, or they could, as in COVID, they could be cells infected with the virus that are acting like virus producing factories because viruses can only go within living cells. So we were working with a virus and we discovered this, how these killer T cells bump off the virus producing factories. And that's what allows us to get better because you have to get rid of those to stop that, those new virus particles from infecting more cells in us. So. So uh, they, they kill it in order to save us, so to speak. So uh, it's actually very strange. I'm on a Zoom call with the professor for anyone in the audience. It's very strange having a direct conversation with you because I was watching the recent ABC documentary yesterday. So it's a little bit, uh, yeah, right, a little right. bit confronting. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that was fun. Briefly <laughs> give us the... <laughs> it was a great documentary, highly recommended. Well, uh, yeah, Sonia Pemberton who made COVID. that is great. And Sonia also has another documentary, which you can find on SBS called Jabbed. It was made years ago, so it's not about COVID, but it's about vaccines. And if you're vaccine hesitant and you haven't seen it, take a look at Jabbed. It's on SBS online, okay? That's Australia for the foreign audience. Jabbed, you, maybe it's findable online and the recent one, but. Prof Doherty uh, contributed to heavily is catching COVID, I believe it's called. It's on ABC in Australia and it will come overseas, I expect. I believe it may, be, it may be distributed by a major distributor in North America, probably globally, in fact, but not yet. Yeah. Prof, thank you. Could you please give us the case for, we're going to get to the vaccine hesitancy in a minute, but can you give us the case for vaccinating against COVID despite whatever risks there may be from the vaccines. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Uh, vaccination, like anything else, is a bit of risk. There's always there's a risk in everything we do. And you, know, you will have heard about the risk of uh, some horrible blood clots associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which can kill somewhere between about one in 200,000 and one in a million people who get that vaccine. Uh, you've got to keep in mind that thinking in terms of relative risk, four in 100,000 people die every year in Australia from something to do with a motor vehicle accident. So you've got to keep that relative risk equation in your mind because we take risks all the time. Okay, so the case for vaccination, what vaccination does, it gives you an antibody response. These are the molecules that rush around in the blood, not the killer T cells that I talked about so much, though you can get some of those made. They're antibodies, their molecules rush around in the blood. They're very, very specific for what we call the spike protein of the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They bind onto that spike protein and they stop the virus getting into our cells. And, um, and they're very good at stopping that for any virus that gets into the blood because this virus, COVID-19, gets into the blood, SARS-CoV-2 gets into your blood, it's what's called a viremic or a systemic infection, goes around your body, it can infect cells in your heart and your kidneys and your brain and your blood vessel walls, it can cause horrible blood clots 
and it kills, uh, and it kills a percentage of people. So basically, the vaccines cause you to make antibodies to that spike protein. The vaccines themselves can't infect anybody else. They, they, all they do is when they're given into your arm, the vaccine gets up into what we call the, the glands under your armpit, what we call the axillary lymph nodes. The vaccine travels up to there and it stimulates an immune response. The vaccine actually can't reproduce itself, unlike the virus, which does reproduce itself, can't reproduce itself, can't infect anybody, and can't actually even infect any more of yours or, or get into any more of your, your cells outside those ones that are in your armpit. And that creates the immune response, which makes the antibody molecules, which float around in your blood, which stop that bloodborne phase of infection and stop you getting really sick. So if you look at the data from the United States right now, where about 70% of people over 18 have been double vaccinated, the people that are dying in the United States of COVID, 99.5% of the people dying from COVID in the United States are unvaccinated. So that's why you want to get vaccinated. Because even when we get to quite high levels of vaccine immune protection, the, the vulnerable are the unvaccinated. They can still get it. And actually, they can still get it from vaccinated people. Because this virus, though it keeps the virus under control in your blood, it may not control it quite as well up in your nose. So a lot of vaccinated people get a bit of infection. They can even get some symptoms and uh, they can transmit. Not as much as an unvaccinated person, they can still transmit. So if you're unvaccinated, 80% of the people around you are vaccinated, you're not protected. You can still get it and you can still get it from the vaccinated people uh, who have got a mild infection, even a clinical infection, uh, but not enough to put them in hospital up here in their nose. You've got to get vaccinated. The risk, because this country is going to open up, Australia is going to open up. And of course, if you're in the Netherlands or in the UK or in uh, America, you're, you're fully exposed if you're not vaccinated. Yeah, so Prof, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> reset the room, as we say on Clubhouse, and, and explain to people that we have Nobel prize-winning immunologist Peter Doherty um, with us. He's joining me via Zoom call and the audio is being patched through to Clubhouse. Um, we are going to try and take questions from the audience in a little bit. What I'm trying to do is get through as many of uh, the FAQs, the frequently asked questions, and the people who are vaccine hesitant as possible, uh, and maybe a couple of my pet questions. But I'm really, if, if Professor Doherty can, I'd like to keep him on for a couple of audience questions if possible. So please do stick around. And I never asked for this, but please feel free to ping your friends in now and bring them in because this is, I think, a critical room. And we are giving voice to the concerns of people who are very, very vaccine hesitant and even people who I regard as uh, anti-vax, but I know people don't like that uh, reference. So, uh, Professor, um, this is about concerns. One of the reasons I, I started these rooms and, and um, I've been, apparently I've become something of a, of, of the, I've become the more dominant uh, person starting rooms about vaccines in the last two weeks on this platform, was I joined a room where there was a lot of misinformation. And also simultaneously, I discovered that a couple of my family members, um, my uh, extended but pretty close family members were very concerned, very, very concerned. They're seeing a lot of stuff online that's very, very scary. And sometimes it's got elements of truth to it, but it lacks context. <clears throat> so there's so many questions I want to ask you, Prof, and it's almost like Schindler's List, where Oscar Schindler at the end of the movie is, you know, this watch, if I just sold this watch, I want to ask you so many questions. So let's try and address the top ones. mRNA is a new technology, they fear. These vaccines were developed in record times. What about long-term effects? Um, I say to them, well, the long-term effects, I mean, you don't know the long-term effects of COVID. Aren't you more scared of the long-term effects of COVID than you are of of the potential effects of the vaccines, which most biologists, most immunologists are saying they can't see why there would be long-term effects. It's never emerged in a vaccine before, after the sort of two month window after vaccination. Um, okay, and I'll give you a couple more. Um, they're obviously concerned about the adverse events like clotting or heart inflammation. And mm -hmm. then you get into the more anti-vax stuff, which I can actually, the even stronger, more skeptical, more I would call conspiratorial claims. I want to throw at you in a minute to steal man the position 
you know, the opposite okay. of straw man. Don't want to steel man their position. So could you address at least some of these, the mRNA new technology, okay. the record okay, the time first development? One, the first one about the blood clotting issue, the TTS syndrome, as it's called, with AstraZeneca, uh, the adenovirus vectored vaccine. It, it also happens a bit with the J&J &J vaccine. I haven't heard about Sputnik, the, the Russian vaccine, which uses similar technology, but one would guess it may happen there a bit as well. So, so this is a horrible condition, and, but it's very, very infrequent. It's very rare. And it's, um, it's, it can be something like one in 33,000 in occurrence in, in say younger women, which are the most susceptible. Um, initially, death rates were very high because it's a very odd type of clotting. It's not like the clotting you get with deep vein thrombosis or the clotting that's associated with taking the reproductive pill. These are at a much higher incidence, but the doctors treat those with heparin, the anticoagulant drug heparin, and that helps people a lot and people are generally okay. But with this thing that the AstraZeneca is associated with, though it's very low frequency, if you give people heparin, it will kill them. So the doctors soon woke up to that and they started to use another coagulant, anticoagulant that doesn't do this. And they use, give what's called intravenous immunoglobulin. This is a very common procedure in people to give intravenous plasma from other people. It, it, it's used to protect people whose immune system just aren't working for one reason or other. And they get this stuff once a month. But giving the heparin, you know, not giving heparin, giving something else to stop the clotting and giving the IVIG means that many fewer people now are dying of it. That doesn't mean it won't leave some chronic sequelae in people who survive. But, but you've got to re remember that the incidence of this and death result of this is very, very high, somewhere between one and 200,000, one in a million, maybe a bit low for some groups, I'm not sure. But it's very low compared with mortality from COVID. I mean, if you get COVID, the possibility of a 50-year-old dying from COVID is about one in 500. And of course, it goes up massively as you get older. And then now with this Delta variant circulating in the United States and in other countries, and, and with a lot of people vaccinated, we're seeing relatively more disease in younger people and younger people dying. We just had a 38 year old die in Australia. We've had very little infection here because we kept it out, but we do have an outbreak in Sydney at the moment. And there are a number of younger people uh, from teenagers up currently in hospital and the same is happening across the planet. So, so basically that's the risk of AstraZeneca, the risk of COVID. The risk of the Pfizer mRNA vaccines, one of the side effects that's been associated with it is myocarditis. This is inflammation of the heart, particularly in younger males. It, as far as I know, that has been handled pretty well by hospitalizing people. They come out of it and they're okay. But there are these risk factors. Nothing in life is without risk. Crossing a street is not without risk. Nothing is without risk. And the risk of COVID is horrific. Now, if you're thinking about long-term effects, it seems that firstly, if you get COVID and you do recover, you can get what I call post-COVID. That is, just as with any very, very severe infection where you end up in an ICU or even on a ventilator, you can suffer severe permanent damage. You will never be the same again. Influenza in the elderly, for instance, even if people don't die, often tips them over into a state where they will die earlier or they will be compromised. They will never be as well again. And, and that is the case for post-COVID. A number of the people who've been in hospital come out will never be as good again. But then we've got this other terrible post-COVID post or long COVID symptom where people of any age, any age at all, can have a relatively mild initial infection. Then they develop this chronic fatigue, chronic uh, pain, headaches, all sorts of stuff. 
and and that can go on for months now some the figures vary greatly on this and i'm not totally sure of incidents and i can't get solid figures on the extent to which um, vaccination protects but basically at least something like 30 percent of people can have a bit of this 10 percent pretty persistent and maybe one percent are having really long long-term problems with this and we have no idea this where this will go in the long term so when you say well we've never given mrna vaccines before let's talk about that okay so if you've had measles mumps rubella yellow fever vaccines uh, um, polio, Sabin, these are all live vaccines, okay? They're live viruses. What they are is viruses that decades back were passaged through cultures or passaged through some sort of lab animal like a mouse, and they were what we call attenuated. So when you get any of those vaccines, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, you get a bit of infection up here in your, your throat region, and you don't even notice it. And, but it, you can get some live virus coming out at the other end in your stools. And they stop the disease by making antibodies that stop what we call the viremic phase. Measles and polio, for example, are, disease, are what we call systemic diseases. The fact you've got spots on your skin is not because you catch the virus from someone else's skin. It's because you catch it up here and it gets into your blood and it goes around your body in your blood and it gets out, goes out to your skin that gives you spots. It can go into your brain, your middle ear uh, and, in, and, and in your lungs and cause problems there, which can be chronic problems. So we stop it in the blood. But the point I'm saying is these are, are live virus vaccines. Live virus vaccines make proteins the same way anything else makes protein. They make mRNA messenger RNA, which is the template for making protein. So any infection you get, whether it's a vaccine infection or the infection you get from your kids when they come home from preschool and you get that respiratory thing again that you had when you were a kid, you're making lots of mRNA. You're making lots of viral mRNA. Apart from that, in our bodies every day, we make millions of mRNAs. We make mRNAs while we're thinking. mRNA is... Is, is, is absolutely central to life. Now, the mRNA that's in the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine will go into cells in your arm region because that's where it's injected. It might get into some of your muscle cells and it'll stay there. And you might get a bit of the reaction you might get later might be due to uh, our immune cells attacking those cells. But it will principally go into a cell we call the dendritic cell the mRNA will, and that they will carry the mRNA into our lymph nodes in here, and that's where our immune response will kick off. Now, that will lead to making the protein, the virus spike protein, that, that, that the, the one protein from COVID 2 that is in the vaccine, just one protein. It can't be infectious. They can't infect anyone else, and it can't even infect more cells in us. It'll go through what we call a one-step growth cycle in our own cells. Now, people have found a little bit, some of that, a little bit of that mRNA may be in the blood. Maybe it, uh, maybe it does circulate a bit. It would be very small amounts and it would be taken out pretty quickly. But basically, it's nothing mysterious about mRNA. You don't live without mRNA. There's no life without mRNA. You can't eat anything that doesn't have nucleic acids or DNA in it. Uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine actually carries in the viral DNA for the spike protein. That DNA goes to the nucleus. It then makes mRNA, and then it comes out in the cytoplasm. The mRNA in the Pfizer vaccine doesn't ever get into the nucleus of the cell where the, the genetic material is. It's in the cytoplasm, in the, outside the nucleus. Prof, thank you. I know that you, have, you might have till half past the hour for us. If we have that, then we, I can figure out how we can do this. No, no, I can keep, I can keep on. It's fine. We can go for an hour if you want. We'll take you for three hours if you can. No, not it. for three it's hours. The, it's Schindler's <laughs> list, man. For, <laughs> we can go for an hour. So we've got That's another fair. half an hour and a bit more, so yeah. So what I'm going to do is ask a few more questions and then um, and then we'll try and open it up for some talk back. So 
look, I want to steal, man. I've, there's so many questions I want to ask you. So uh, I'm going to try and pack up a lot of the the um, vaccine skeptic arguments and throw them at you. There's mm-hmm. a lot of mistrust of institutions, right? There's a lot of mistrust of scientific authority. For instance, you and your colleague were just two people and you proved the whole world wrong. A lot of people were very angry at you. People would say, well, Dr. Whoever it was, there's this guy called Dr. Mercola. There's all these, you know, these group of people who are very, very tiny minority of doctors and vaccine skeptics, right, who say these things. And so let me tell you some of the things they say. But the point is that a lot of the vaccine skeptics are like, well, maybe they're right, like you were right in the 1970s and that won you a Nobel Prize. So let me just tell you some of the things that are said. They say, well, these pharmaceutical companies have a prop. I'm steel manning the position. I don't believe any of this for anyone who's watching this later, okay? Okay, yeah, yeah. so these pharmaceutical companies have a profit motive. So therefore, there's reason for government, who's in cahoots with big business, to suppress therapeutics like ivermectin or the ivermectin triple therapy. I believe that includes azithromycin and zinc, along with ivermectin. Um, vaccine injuries being suppressed is far bigger than anyone's admitting. They mentioned the VAERS data in the United States, which is, you know, 6,000 plus people have died in some period after their vaccinations. And they say, well, that's a big worry. And even <laughs> that, they say, is an underreporting. Yeah. I'm going to throw a lot of misinformation at you now. I'm going to take 15 more seconds. Okay. They say the data, the data reporting is terrible. The virus itself is over-exaggerated. I'm not, I'm trying to steal man your case, guys. I'm trying to steal man your case. Please, anyone in the audience, I'm trying to do my best. They say the spike protein is potentially cytotoxic. They claim that the guy who invented, quote unquote, mRNA said on the Dark Horse podcast with Brett Weinstein that the, the spike protein is cytotoxic. It damages cells in the body. Um, there, mis- the reporting of cases is suspect. The public health system is suspect. Fauci said not to wear masks. And then he said he, he said to wear masks. He, they told everyone that they were ineffective. Um, I think I've covered. So my question, I guess, is have you come yeah. across this level of misinformation? Are you aware of how widespread? It is, and yeah, how do no. you respond to it? And how to? What's the best way to respond to it? I, I I'm on Twitter, so I do come across all this, and I try to respond uh, respectfully, unless people are abusive. I mean, if people are abusive, I'll block them immediately because I can't, I can't um, be expected to deal with that. But if people are, are, are say yes, I have this concern, or, or I, I'm told that. I mean, for instance, one person got in touch and said, why are we protecting a, against a virus that's um, that 98% of people will survive? Well, well, he was quite wrong. It, it's not 2% of people who die from COVID. It's actually more like 0.3 or 0.5% or 0.8% at most. So he had actually the number far too high. But that's still a lot of people who die. And uh, we saw it in the US when, when it was at its peak and before the vaccines rolled out, we were seeing up to 5,000 people a, di- a day dying of COVID. I don't see any reason to suspect those numbers. They're from CDC and from responsible authorities. These are professional authorities. They're not, they're not uh, answering to government in a way that government wants them to answer. They're professional people who that's been set, their, their monitoring system has been set up forever. So you can be suspicious of government if you like, but uh, I'd be infinitely more suspicious of people who put out conspiracy theories on the internet. But anyway, okay, so that, does, does that it, it is a lethal disease. It, it's killing, I think, and it depends on how good a medical system is. In the medical systems in the United States, if your ICU beds are not overwhelmed, I doubt uh, that if you go through all the age groups in unvaccinated people, it'd be killing more than, certainly less than 1% of the people it infects. The numbers looked higher earlier because case numbers were just being defined by clinical, whereas now we define them by the PCR test, which we've never done this before with any infection tested so widely or so in so much depth. So it's less than 1% of people will die if they're unvaccinated. And, um, but another 1% at least will, I think, be severely compromised. 
by long COVID or post COVID or something else. So that's quite a lot of people if you take a country the size How of many? the US or Europe or whatever. Now, the argument that um, we can't trust the vaccine companies. Well, folks, you may have missed your, 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 your attention, but we live in a capitalist society. This is the way it works. People make products and they, they make a profit from them. Now, AstraZeneca has actually said that the vaccine is going out there at no profit to them. Pfizer are clearly making a profit from it, but that's capitalism. If you want a vaccine developed under a communist totalitarian state, uh, you have to go elsewhere. Uh, and in fact, uh, under a more authoritarian regime, we've got the Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines made by, by China, which don't look to be nearly as good as the ones we have in the West, which are, are really terrific vaccines, actually. So you just got to live with that fact that this is the way our society works. And when we go and vote, that's what we vote for. We're not voting for a communist state centrally controlled by people who command that you will make this or you will not make that. That's not the way our society works. And thank goodness for that. So profit, yes, yeah, sure. All right. Is anyone making money out of this? I'm certainly not making money out of it by uh, uh, the drug companies are, that's all. Yeah. I'm very conscious of our time. I'm gonna try and do a couple of rapid fires. Um, so what, um, uh, okay. So if you've had two shots of, Astra, of either that, you and I have both had two shots of the AstraZeneca or right. if you've had two shots of the mRNA, the Pfizer or Moderna, what precautions should you be taking whether you're in Sydney or London or, or New York? And what precautions should someone who's unvaccinated be taking? And let's try and keep it brief because I want to rapid fire a couple. Okay. Of things. Okay. So, so basically, firstly, you should look at what the public health people are saying. Uh, if they're telling you to wear a mask, wear a mask. I mean, we've just got to, the, the public health professional, I'm not a public health doctor. I'm a research scientist. So the public health people are trying to, trying to range, uh, arrive at something that protects people and particularly the unvaccinated people. So if they say wear a mask, wear a mask. Personally, if I was in the UK and um, double vaccinated, a lot of virus circulating, I've had two shots of AstraZeneca. My susceptibility is reduced from that of an 80 year old, which I am, to that of a 50 year old. So I can still catch this thing and die, but I'm much less likely to. So I would be wearing a mask and I would be staying away from bars and nightclubs. But at 80 year olds, you tend to stay away from bars and nightclubs anyway. It's not mostly. So do what the, do what the public health believe, people are saying. Professor, when I look at you, I find that hard to believe. True. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bar hopper. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, long, uh, long haul COVID, how scary and how protective are the vaccines? And what well, might I mean, look like? I find it very scary. I mean, you know, my personal position, I mean, I know that people who are hesitant about vaccines don't want this foreign stuff put into their bodies. I, I, I understand that, that people feel like that, and especially about it being injected. But I can tell you, I'm a hell of a lot more scared about COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 being in my body because it multiplies, it divides, it produces billions of copies of itself. It infects cells all over the body. I, do, I don't want any of that. Okay, so we know the vaccines don't protect totally against infection up here. Easy to keep antibody levels high in the blood, very hard to keep antibody levels high up here. Antibodies are molecules, virus particles are tiny particles. They have no motor, they don't move themselves around, just random chance where they bump into each other. In the blood, there's a lot more, they take it out. Okay, so, so vaccinated people still get some infection. They can still transmit to some extent. They can still develop symptoms, but in 99%, those, 90 those symptoms won't be bad enough to cause you to go to hospital. Okay, so, um, so um, long COVID. I'm trying to get numbers, good numbers, on how much vaccines protect against people developing long COVID. And it's quite difficult. It's difficult because, you know, it's long. And so we're, we're waiting to look at these series. And, and there's a lot of confusion. A lot of the, a lot of the reporting is self-reporting. Um, and a lot of it is, uh, it, it, and it's not, what I've seen is not very clearly expressed. Uh, someone said that decreased, vaccination decreases the possibility 30%. What are they talking about? 
30% in clinical cases, 30% against what? So I'm waiting for good data from reliable sources. I'm, I'm sure vaccination gives you a pretty good level of protection. How absolute is that? I don't know. And how it would influence the duration of any long COVID symptoms, I don't know. It's like a lot of things with COVID, we've just got to wait and find out. Yeah, I was looking forward to my uh, to waiting for my Novavax booster because I'm most concerned about long COVID. Uh, I was hoping that Gladys yeah. Berejiklian would keep it COVID zero until then. I don't want to get into policy because I know there's differences on suppression and and and, and elimination, and, and we've got a global audience. There's hundreds of people in the room. Uh, we've got a Nobel Prize winning um, immunologist Peter Doherty with us. Um, what does 22 look like at this point? If we're if we're well vaccinated, what does opening up look like? What does the long term look like? And Let's try and keep it brief because there's a lot of questions. Yeah, it's really, it's, 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 it's two different scenarios. One, if we stay with the present situation where Delta is dominating uh, and the vaccines are handling that pretty well, though the virus has changed a bit, I reckon by Australia, in Australia, for instance, everyone who wants to get a vaccine and two shots of a vaccine should be able to get it by the end of this year or very early next year. So and that's when politicians are thinking about opening up. I'm not a policy person. I don't get, you know, don't get into that. So basically, I think by 2022, we'll be in, I hope, we'll have at least 80% of people vaccinated and, and we'll be in pretty good shape with the possibility of opening up or, or at least stopping these local lockdowns that we're experiencing at the moment. Now, I think if we're at that stage by the end of 22 and the virus doesn't develop what we call an immune escape mutant. And it's showing no signs of that at the moment. And I'm wondering if it will, because the mutation rates in this virus are very, very low compared with say an influenza or HIV. We may not see immune escape variants. If we don't see immune escape variants, I think we'll be in a totally different situation by the end of 2022. If we do see immune escape mutants, we'll need to be boosted with new, new generation vaccines. That could, could slow things down a lot. But I, I think actually mid to late 2022 could be looking very, very different from what it, we're seeing now. From your mouth to the deity's ear, Professor, um, I'm being back channeled uh, by some very vaccine hesitant people. Can you hear mm -hmm. me, Professor? Okay. I'm yeah. being messaged in the background by some very vaccine hesitant people okay, to sure. just very, very briefly readdress this issue of ivermectin and the Barodi protocol. Yeah, ivermectin, ivermectin is a wonderful drug. It's, it's, uh, there's a Nobel Prize for it, actually, to Dr. Campbell, who developed it. It was developed a bit originally to treat heartworm in dogs. It does a wonderful job treating uh, river blindness in humans at quite low dose levels. The first indications that um, ivermectin might be useful against SARS-CoV-2, I mean, there are some scientific basis for thinking it could be, were developed actually in Melbourne uh, between Monash University and Melbourne University, where I am. Uh, the problem though was you'd, you had to use very, very high dose level. Now, there mean lots of trials out there and some claim to show benefit. And there's a lot of what we call meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis really, you take a whole lot of trials no matter how good or bad they are, you combine all the data together and you come to a conclusion. And there's some meta-analysis type information that says it could be helpful. As far as I'm concerned, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, but all I know is that our infectious disease doctors who are very happy to use any drug and cheap drugs, they're using uh, uh, corticosteroid that's cheap, they're using heparin that's cheap, they'll use anything. Our medical doctors will not use ivermectin. They're, too, they, they're not convinced of any of the trial data. And they, they, these are trial-focused trial, trial focused people. They're not convinced of any of the trial data. And they're not convinced that the stuff's not toxic and that it may be killing people or damaging people who are taking a lot of this stuff. So ivermectin, personally, I don't know. I don't think there's any reason why physicians would be reluctant to use it if it was the miracle drug. On the other hand, there are some good drugs coming down the line. But again, people who hate, <laughs> hate capitalism are going to hate this because they're from Merck and, uh, and Pfizer. Yep. Um, I, look, I'm getting a lot of questions. I can't ask every single question. They want me to press you on ivermectin and observational data. I, we don't have time for that. That's um, all I know about yeah. it, really. I, I'm, I, I'm still waiting. I, I'm open-minded about it. But if the doctors aren't using it, 
you've got to ask why. There's no reason they wouldn't use it if it helped. You know, the, all the doctors want to do is keep people out of ICUs and save people. And uh, that's all. They're, they're not in this for the money. They don't get anything out of it. And they're getting exhausted in places where the infection is at high institute. And they're dying too, some of them. Or they were before they got vaccinated. Let me jump to, uh, I've got I've got a couple of other questions and I'm going to take moderator privilege to do them in a minute. But you mentioned in the documentary, um, what's it called? Catching COVID uh, that aired a couple of days. Catching COVID? Is that what yeah, it's yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You, you mentioned in it that, that, that the, these um, infectious diseases are actually emerging far more, uh, far more common they, they are because of international travel. Since 2000, we've had a number of novel coronaviruses, I believe, emerge, yeah, yeah, sure. or, or at least in, pandemic threats emerge. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, the key issue is they're coming from a country, countries that um, have a lot of this um, wet market type thing. And mm -hmm. so and you actually hinted at potential border issues that may have to be longer term, although it was between the lines in what you said. Again, I don't mean to get controversial. I'm bringing this up because um, Yuri Dagan is here on stage with us, and I'd like to give a couple of minutes to a, a brief response between the two of you. Yuri Dagan was um, uh, has, has was one of the first to discuss the lab leak hypothesis. I know you yeah, listen, strongly the, against The lab leak being... hypothesis. I, there's no disproof of the lab leak hypothesis. There's no proof of it. There's no reason to suggest it. It doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, if it, if it came out, if it was a virus that was isolated and went into a lab and escaped, or a virus that came out of nature, what the hell? It doesn't make any difference to the way we handle this infection, how we get out of it, or how we deal with the next one. So I, I really don't want to discuss it. It's a waste of space and a waste of time. And what that's, it's saying, no, that's is, fine. what it's saying is be suspicious of the virologists, hate the scientists, they're dangerous. This is crap and I'm really annoyed by it. It's a waste of time. I can take a hint, Professor. Well, it's important uh, <laughs> to prevent the next pandemic if this one was caused by gain of function. And some virologists could be lying very well. Uh, uh, and, uh, Yuri, they uh, claim I, that it's, you know, it's a useless Yuri, argument. You have, uh, we know that we Yuri. know that the SARS-CoV-1 came out through a wet market. We know that. We know these viruses and so, other viruses go from bats to animals to humans. And focusing on the lab, but you have no to... evidence at all that this did. So you have plenty oh, of evidence. Total, that is totally with bullshit. Yuri, with respect, that's sorry, just with bullshit. Respect, Yuri, our guest has said he doesn't want no, to talk about it. No, it's not. The bullshit it. is I can't, I can't denying the It's bullshit. It could have been a lab leak. That's bullshit. Yuri, hold on. Just we should respect uh, uh, Peter's wishes if he doesn't if he doesn't want to discuss it. Um, yeah. Again, doesn't want to discuss this. It's I'm a sorry, waste of we time. Continue. It's a waste of time. No, it's not. It's not a waste of time. Is that the science okay. is important to prevent the next pandemic? If you want science, and it's science virologists. I'm sorry. To stop trying to find Professor, these things and work uh, on them. That's what you do. Yuri's, Yuri Dagan has, has been on stage with us before and has, has basically been very, uh, he's discussed the vaccine, he's shut down his information, but you've made. Simply because you've made it clear you don't want to continue talking about it, I've, I don't. I've had to bring him down to the, no, no, I, to I, the I, audience. I, That's fine. I just don't see that. I don't see the point of pursuing it at this stage. The, the basically, what happened with this virus? The best chance of finding out exactly where it would have come from would have been to quietly leave it to the virologists who are talking to each other across the planet, including the Chinese virologists, and and let it be worked out. And, and it became rapidly politicised. And suddenly it assumes terrific significance to know where this virus come from. It, it doesn't actually help us deal with this pandemic. And I don't think it'll help us deal with the next pandemic. I think what's obvious is that wet markets, we know this from flu, uh, live bird markets, live animal markets are dangerous. And, but the other thing that's dangerous is the fact that where these viruses are sitting in the world, and, and the weather is likely of human contact through animals or whatever, is China uh, and those countries that have these live markets. And the numbers of passenger air flights out of those countries have increased massively. So whereas before 2000, we had two of these things circulating in humans, we, we've had five new ones, maybe one that was there before we missed, but we missed. So we have four at least new ones circulating in the human population since 2000. What's really dangerous is international air travel. So if I was going to fault the Chinese on this, I'd say their really major fault was not being open enough right at the beginning and in continuing international flights out of their country. 
Uh, okay, so Australia. the answer is not to not to introduce border controls with China. It's it's simply to press China to be more cognizant. And, no, I think all countries. We we need a policy that says that any country that gets a flare up of something like this stops its international flights straight away, especially international passenger flights. And I think that's what we need to look at. Now, if it good luck, out, good luck with that with a non democracy professor. Well, <laughs> with a democracy, good luck with a democracy in doing it. We did it in Australia, but. But I think um, I think we'll, we need we need to have this this discussion in a big way. I've got more questions. I'm going to bring up one of my biggest, I would say, extremely vaccine skeptical uh, interlocutors. Very briefly, you've got 30 seconds, uh, Rowan. Make it uh, the moment of your life. Come to speak now, Rowan. Ask your question. I'm going to cut you off after 30 seconds. I'm sorry, we don't have enough time. Rowan, go ahead. Thanks, Gabe. I had my bar mitzvah, but my bar mitzvah, that was the biggest time of my life, but it's very nice to meet you. Rowan, get to the question, mate, please. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor, I, there are thousands of doctors who are prescribing um, different types of therapies um, around the world and are having a, lot, a great deal of success. Um, there are people on, who are either pro-vaccine there are also people who are, who are anti-vaccine, but there are also a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant. Briefly, Rowan. Thanks, Gabe. I don't see this as, and a number of people don't see this as a binary issue. Wondering how, what your perspective is on this. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Rowan. Look, appreciate um, it. Rowan, I'd, I'd, I'd seek to, I would like to, to help convince the vaccine hesitant to get vaccinated because making our own antibodies against this thing is the best protection we can get. And it's, it's working because vaccinated people are not in the main dying of COVID. As far as therapies are concerned, I think we definitely need good drugs. We've got monoclonal antibodies, but they're very expensive to produce and you have to inject them intravenously. And that's, that's what Trump had and why he got better. But, but I think we do need good antiviral drugs. And if my physician colleagues thought there was a good antiviral drug out there, they'd be using it. They are using remdesivir. They know it's pretty limited, actually, but they're still using it. And if they thought ivermectin or anything else was useful, they'd use it. They're just not convinced by the data, by the clinical trial data. And... Uh, Clinical trials have to be done properly. They have to be double blind. That's particularly true of a disease like this where the clinical presentation is so varied and, and you, you can't really assess it without a proper substantial double blind trial. Yeah, my understanding is that the total of the trial participants in ivermectin trials is something around 2,200 mark-ish total. The biggest trial was in Egypt of about 400 people, many of whom were dead by the time they were enrolled in the trial. So the data is not particularly well, good compared to the tens of thousands in each of the vaccine yeah. trials and plus the hundreds of thousands in the population level data. Sorry to interrupt you, Professor. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, there was one fraudulent. It's not to say that the other trials weren't done in good faith. It's just to no. say that they don't seem to be done well enough to satisfy the people who, who look at this stuff critically, which is not me, I, I don't. I mean, not my, my expertise at all. I, I've got, uh, my parents taught me the word chutzpah. I've got the chutzpah to say to you, we've got eight minutes. I wanna be very respectful of your time. If you're willing to give us an extra 15, I'm, I'm pressing you. If, you. if you can't, please. I know you've got a lot of, uh, I, uh, I, a lot I, of things let's, to do. Let's, let's make an extra 15 and then leave it at that, okay? Yeah. Extra 15, so we'll go to quarter two to Sydney time. So uh, I want to uh, let, uh, we've, we've put hand raising up. I'm going to try and see if I can get someone up to ask a question in the meantime. Um, Ned, do you have a burning question? Because I've got a couple of questions I want to ask uh, too. But Ned, did you have anything that you've heard a lot that could help? Yeah, thanks for this, Professor. Really fascinating room. Just wondering around the messaging of how to communicate with people who are vaccine skeptical. Um, one thing we hear from them a lot is they feel as if they're being talked down to, kind of having their finger wagged in their face. And it's almost as if the more qualification somebody has, the less willing, you know, people yeah. are, are to, to hear them. What do we do about that? 
look, I, I, I think we all understand that. And, you know, I'm the worst person in the world. I mean, you know, an old white guy, you know, really. Uh, and, and I understand that very, very much. And I, I think um, a lot of the vaccine has it. And firstly, I mean, trying to, to engage with people who, who have more contact with people in this. A lot of the the real, really embedded anti-vaxxers, the people who are really hostile to vaccine. I, I've had this discussion and, and there are some who sort of um, have made a business of it, but there are others who are just extremely fearful of vaccine. And how do we get them around that? I, I find that very difficult. I, I've been writing explainers that are on our website that there's, I'm up to six, I'm writing number 69 weekly explainers the, trying to talk about the infection and so forth to people who, who don't have, have that science background. And, and you can, anyone can look at them for free. They're on the Doherty Institute website. They're under a heading called Setting It Straight. Otherwise, I think what we are seeing in Australia, uh, which is a big immigrant country, we have a lot of immigrants, a lot of recent immigrants from various types of societies, uh, latterly quite a lot from the Middle East, for example, uh, what's particularly important is to put any messaging, firstly, in their language. We've also got a lot from Asia. We've got a lot of people from China who don't speak English, really. So firstly, it has to be in their language. And secondly, the message needs to be coming from people within their community who they trust. And so that might be their, their GP, their, their, their first first line doctor. It might be from a religious leader. It might be from a community leader. It might be from a prominent person, a sportsman or something like that. And the more we can get those messages coming from people they trust, the better, I think. We don't, the, you can't talk down to people. You've got to try to engage and try to explain your understanding. But of course, for someone like me, that that understanding can be, uh, you know, obviously it's conditioned by my life as a scientist and, and it's in a, at a different level. So to try and put that across at the right level, for instance, is, is can be difficult. I, I keep, keep trying to think of analogies and writing weird stuff. At the moment, I think, you know, if you're thinking about immune escape mutants, all the viruses, that have emerged so far up to Delta. It's like a foot race. It's just that Delta runs faster than all the rest. But if you think of a, a escaping from immunity, think of the flat race of now having to become a hurdler and, and can he move as fast and can he spread as much if you like. So, so I, I try to play with these, try to find wording that will get across to people. But I, I think really, influential people within the community are enormously important. We, we learned that lesson from AIDS, actually, right at the beginning. And, and I think lab scientists like me, who lab it used to be somewhat um, skeptical about the social sciences, really realized how important the social sciences and communication actually are. All right, that's a helpful response. Thank you. Um, should we have Debbie and Sanjana and Alex now up to ask their questions? So welcome. Sorry, them. I was I was muted. It was my mistake. Uh, uh, Prof could probably not hear me. Um, one moment. So uh, I I wanted to uh, just say to Prof that uh, you know I, I pressed you hard before. If you do have to leave, please feel free to say no. Uh, you have to leave in three minutes. But if we've got the extra fifteen, we're going to go to my cousin Debbie's up here. Um, and I'd like to briefly, uh, do you have any questions or concerns, Debbie, that, uh, that remain unanswered by the professor? Look, um, Professor Doherty, thank you so much for being here today. It really actually helped my noise control a little bit as such. I have a question. I'm due to get my mum vaccinated tomorrow morning. She's got COPD, uh, all sorts of health issues. She's on an oxygen machine at the moment, just getting over bronchitis diabetic, high blood pressure, cholesterol, you name it, she's got it. Oh, well. Um, yeah. she, I know, it's, it's horrendous. She's due to get AstraZeneca tomorrow. She's, she's already on um, some type of um, blood thinner. My only fear is that she's not actually going to make the vaccine. I mean, 
I don't know how to explain it, but let's just I, I say know. God yeah. is big. It has, do you know? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know what you're saying. I mean, you know, is she going to make an immune response? That's the question. Is she well enough yeah. to make an immune response? Yeah. Is it going to be affect her negatively? Yeah. You know, the only thing I can say there is, you know, obviously you need to be talking with her doctor as well and, and, and getting yeah. that advice. The other thing, I've just been writing yeah. about this actually for my weekly essay, is when, when we open up, how do we protect those people who can't make an immune response? Now, we do that all the time for people who may be on cancer treatment that's killing off their immune system temporarily, or people, particularly older people, whose immune systems just don't work anymore. And what we do is we give them a product in Australia. It's called Intergam. It's actually plasma blood serum antibodies from other people and that you I think they get that once a month through a tube into their arm and of course at the moment most Australians because we haven't had much COVID won't have antibodies to COVID-2 and so that wouldn't be protected but the more and more people get vaccinated uh, people that are totally immunocompromised will presumably be getting Intragram that has antibody to COVID-2 in it but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a real issue for that very vulnerable uh, elderly group. Okay, uh, any quick follow-up, Deb? Or can we, because we got, we got really, really pressed for time. I've, I've moved you down to the audience. You've got to accept the invitation. Okay, so, well, while she's, if she wants to come back up and ask, did you have anything else, yeah, Deb? Yeah, I, I basically quick? just wanted to say thank you. And would you, would you still recommend her getting vaccinated again deb I, I think that that recommendation should look with her primary carer but right. yes I, I think i think it's worth it's worth trying as long as her her primary physician thinks it's okay and she, she is going to be safe that's a good reminder that we everything here is not medical advice none of what is being said in this room is medical advice and, and by the way to any questioner we are recording this Q and A part of the. Uh, I should have mentioned this before, but I know that Yuri and uh, my yeah. cousin are fine with it. But, I, I, uh, we are I, recording. I owe Yuri an apology for going over the top. I've, I've been dealing with this vaccine origin thing for so long, and our prime minister has cost us billions of dollars in trade by going <laughs> after this with the Chinese, and I just don't see it gets us anywhere. Well, Yuri, so apologies, Yuri. Yuri's I'm in the sorry. audience, and I don't think he took it personally. Thank you for saying that, Rob. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, there's so many more questions. I'm going to ask one about fertility that I'm being asked in the back channels by message. Fertility. People are concerned about yes, the mRNA vaccine. I, I, you can very briefly respond to that. I, I recently became aware of this. I, I didn't know that was a major concern. And over the last month or so, I've become very aware of it. So I've been trying to find out. I've, I've been looking into the literature and, and also I, using Twitter, asking for people to give me feedback. I, I, I just don't see the evidence for there being any effect on fertility, fertility or reproduction. But I, I, I will say this. Firstly, um, some people worry about the vaccine somehow getting into the ovary. Well, for a start, if we even find a little bit, we can find a little bit of spike protein in blood after vaccination, I believe, at, at picogram quantities, really, really minute quantities. Now you're asking that to get selectively into the ovary, and then you're asking it to get to the oocyte, the egg. Now, basically every girl when she's born has all the oocytes, all the eggs she's ever gonna have, unlike, the male who makes sperm all the time. So she's got all the oocytes she's ever gonna have. I think by reproductive age, I, this is not my feel, but I think they're down to about 25%. She's lost a lot of them. And those oocytes have ACE2 on their surface, which is the receptor for COVID-2. So if you're unvaccinated, a young woman, you get infected, not only have you got the chance of developing long COVID, which would, debilitate you horribly, you also have the possibility that that virus might get into your oocytes and kill some of them off. So I can't find any evidence that makes any sense. And I've, I've been talking with gynecologists on, across on Twitter, actually, who've been looking at this. They can't find any evidence that makes any sense. 
why it should impact on fertility. What is clear though, that as COVID infection can impact seriously on your health, that if you get infected while you're pregnant and you get this blood clotting problem, you'll become anoxic, which means the possibility of anoxia for your fetus. So the advice is this, I think, that if you're, you're young and not pregnant, get vaccinated as soon as you can if you're thinking of having a child. So you've got good antibody levels to protect you and the fetus. Uh, yesterday, I think we had one of our senior medical doctors on our public health team in Victoria, Australia, who's a pregnant, a heavily pregnant woman uh, getting the vaccine because she said, this is something I have to do to protect me and the baby. And if you're a guy and you're worried about it affecting your sperm, uh, I think worry a lot more about getting long COVID. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we've got uh, nine more minutes. Uh, we've got 11 more minutes with you. So uh, we've got time for Sanjana and I've got a couple of uh, a quick rapid fire questions. Sanjana, would you briefly uh, ask your question? Sanjana is a bit of a clubhouse star and she's um, a bit of an expert on consciousness, if I may say. Okay. Go ahead, Sanjana. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Gabe. Hello, Peter. Um, I, uh, I highly respect you for the work you've done. Um, I recently went to this Lancet paper the other day, uh, which kind of stated that um, to uh, briefly, like just to um, give you a summary, that it states that COVID kind of kills uh, brain cells. And uh, if, if the data is being corrected, interpreted, like if it's uh, being interpreted correctly, around 0 0.5 IQ points and a severe infection could cost around five to nine IQ points deduction, even if you recover from uh, COVID or mm -hmm. catching COVID. So I was wondering what is the validity of that particular thing? Uh, because the sample size, if I'm not mistaken, in the Lancet paper was 80,000 people. Um, and so I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, you, you probably know more about this than I do, in fact. I, I, I'm very intrigued by it because actually first part of my career, I worked as a neuropathologist. So I, I was in the brain area for a long time, but then, then sort of got out of it. But uh, there is some, of course, viruses do get into the brain. They do kill cells, that's polio. Uh, how much this virus is getting into the brain and how much it's killing cells, I've never been quite clear. It, it will have effects. It causes blood clots. So obviously you can have a stroke. And there have been, been strokes that, that are much lower down in the sort of um, uh, carotid circulation than, than normally would be the case and massive strokes as a result of COVID. And of course, uh, you can get heart attacks as a result. And anoxia obviously is not good for the brain anyway. So, um, and there's also evidence of cortical shrinkage and, um, and so forth. So I, I'm not that clear on the whole thing. There's clearly a brain pathology to it how much it reflects virus getting into the brain, I'm unclear. I wondered about it early on uh, from, you know, when you infect the nose, there's always a possibility a virus can go up through the nerve cells that, that innovate the nose. But I, I, know, I don't think that was ever the case or ever clear. And then of course, there's the other thing, there's this brain fog that everyone talks about with long COVID, you know, that just basically people can't think clearly. And this can go on for months. And it sort of goes up and down. So, so really, I, I don't have a lot to add about that. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Sanjana. Um, Alex, we've only got seven minutes with the prop, eight minutes. Uh, can you ask very briefly a rapid fire question, please? Will do. Uh, thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Ned. Um, uh, Dr. Doherty, what is the difference uh, on the immune response uh, between catching COVID? Uh, naturally versus mm. the immune response if you're vaccinated. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. We and we don't fully understand it, but you know, if you catch COVID naturally, you've got all those proteins of COVID, including things like proteases and so forth, which are in, required for the virus replication. We make antibodies against all those, but they give us no protection at all. The only antibodies we can that can protect are ones against the spike, which is the one on the surface. Antibodies don't get into cells and do things to cell inside cells. They do things to whatever's outside the cell. They're too big to get in. And if they do get in, they get chopped up and destroyed. 
So, so it's just a spike on the vax in the vaccine. That's the protective antibody, as far as we know. And basically, the vaccines in general are doing better uh, than the the infection. And so, anyone who who's had COVID and they're in a COVID-exposed environment is very well advised to also get vaccinated. I talked to a physician in Nashville last week. He was telling me he has two people, two older patients who had COVID early on, and they've now been reinfected with the Delta variant and they were in ICU. So, so the vaccine does a better job and will get to herd immunity better by vaccination than by infection. Now, the virus, what is it doing? <clears throat> It may be suppressing the immune response in some respects. It's very complicated. You know, all infections are very complicated. This one seems particularly so. Um, I'm in Sydney, Prof. Thank you for that answer. I'm in Sydney, and uh, without entering into the ridiculous politics of how we got here, um, is this outbreak capable of being eliminated? And I'm extremely COVID cautious. Should I be trying to move to Canberra at this point or, or Victoria? Or I've had my two vaccinations. How would you, what's your <laughs> just, just don't move to Victoria and bring the virus with you. We're sick of being locked down. Oh, look, I, I, again, I, I, I think the, the Premier is being advised by, by very competent and smart people. Uh, I, I hope you're, you're still not locked down as hard as Victoria locks down. Um, you know, five kilometre radius, everyone in the house right across the state. So you're still not locked down to that some extent. So there's some flexibility. It's disturbing that case numbers are still going up. Uh, but, you know, I can't advise the New South Wales Premier. And, and uh, um, she made a mistake. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And um, uh, locked down far too late. I wasn't asking you to weigh into politics. We can have another discussion about no. that if you were willing. Another I time. I think we all, but we all know that one. I mean, everyone understands that. Yeah. Yes, uh, some of us were calling it in advance, but there you go. That's the hypochondria, uh, hypochondriac in me. Um, I've, I'm going to take moderated privilege because we've only got four minutes. Uh, quick question: Rapamycin, Peter Atiyah uses it in the United States for longevity. It's showing some uh, some some promise, but it's very early stages. Do you have any opinion at all at this point? Don't even don't even know about it. Actually, haven't 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 engaged with it. Yeah, yeah. There's this, yep. this, this, no problem. This, it's, this, it, it, there's this senescence argument and so forth. And you know, the, 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 there may be various ways out there that we, we're just beginning to access. You know, I, I the thing I would say as a generalisation, we're learning a massive amount from this. We've, we've never done this before. We've never, we've never had a, a widespread infection where we've got a specific diagnosis in large numbers of people who don't have to develop any symptoms. We're going to learn an enormous amount from this, but it's going to take a while, a while to unpick. Two final questions, Prof. Uh, as scary, and I want to ask you so many more, but uh, we're coming up to your limit here. As scary as this pandemic is, what's the biggest threat on the horizon in your view? Oh, I, you know, I think, I hope that, in, at least in countries like Australia, we're going to be largely through this by the end of next year. And, and maybe we've got a couple more years to run globally as we, we're slow in rolling up vaccines, but, but it's a limited thing. And it's, it's, it's killed a lot of people, but it hasn't killed anything like the numbers of people the 1918-19 flu pandemic killed. It killed 50 to 100 million people in a world population that is a third less than it is today. So, you know, just just to put it in perspective, uh, my, my concern is really the, the consequence of uh, ongoing climate change. I, I think this is the major threat to the human future in all sorts of ways. I can't continue. I'm not a physical scientist, but as a biological scientist, I'm very interested in the effects of global warming, climate change, and all those things on living organisms for obvious reasons. So. So that, I think, that's where the long-term focus needs to be. And uh, I'm really quite disturbed by some of the things, for instance, that have been happening in Australia in that direction. And uh, you know, I, on the one hand, I, in Twitter, I support the government absolutely on, on the COVID program. And I'm constantly attacking them on climate change. Yeah, it's good. 
Prof, thank you so much for that. Okay, well, I have two two final questions and we've got two minutes, so that's good. So one is you were so sweet crediting your wife with basically your entire career on the program mm -hmm. the other day. Did you want to say a few words about uh, about that, about your personal life and about how wonderful your wife has been in supporting and, and even maybe causing your career in some ways? Yeah, I, you know, we've been married for a very long time and it's my first marriage, so to speak. So, so basically, uh, yeah, I, a loyal companion and a great friend. And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, marriages work out differently for different people. That's the way it worked out for me. But, um, but it's, um, it, it's if you're going to be a research scientist, which is a pretty rackety life in a way, because we live off our wits and that's a demanding way to live. Um, it's great to have stability in your home situation. That, that's certainly a big plus. And of course, the other, among my colleagues, I mean, my wife and I don't work together in science, but among my colleagues, uh, she helps a lot because she has some science background, but we don't, we never run a lab or anything like that. But, uh, but uh, among my colleagues, there are some great husband and wife teams that are really tremendously powerful over the years. You you may have convinced me not to stay a lifelong bachelor. So we'll see how that goes. I'll update you. Uh, Prof, final question, and then I'll thank you and we'll wrap up. Uh, we're literally on the hour. So uh, what book would you recommend my book club read next month? Oh, I mean, there's a wonderful book being published next next week called An Insider's Plague Year by me. <laughs> you could read that. Um, I should have <laughs> clarified. You can't pick your own books. <laughs> uh, okay. Look, I, uh, one, of the, one of the downsides of this whole thing is I've always read a lot all my life. I just haven't been reading at all. So I'm the last person to ask. I've just been totally immersed in this COVID thing. And I, I'm, I'm really going a bit nuts as a result, I think. And uh, I need to get out of this. I'll be glad when this is over. I, I can do without this, I can tell you. Well, good. So by default, but you could go back and read, read, selected... read, read War and Peace. That, that's always good. Oh, okay. I was going to say my pick for the next one and that you would basically agree by default, but War and Peace it is. Professor, yeah, no, I, I, I can't thank I don't you know. enough. There are, there are the great classics out there, I, but I just haven't been reading much in literature lately. I'd like to read the latest Richard Flanagan book about uh, the salmon fisheries and so forth in Tasmania. I think Richard Flanagan's a terrific writer. Professor, I can't thank you enough. You've been incredibly generous with your time and I have such, I know everyone here has a huge amount of respect to you. You've reached a lot of people here and hopefully I'll push it out more when I publish it on YouTube uh, and, and so forth. But thank you so, so very much. There's too much misinformation out there and not nearly enough Peter Doherty's. So yeah, feel, thank you. Feel, feel free to edit out the bit with Yuri where I, where I lost it. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, nice to chat. Now we're we'll talk to your I'll assistant about back. it. Yeah, all good yeah. factors here. And I, I just want to mention one one message I got from a friend who's been listening the whole time. Professor, he just said, this guy is doing the Lord's work right now. Couldn't agree more. So thank you for all that you've done to spread the word about well, how, well, to, that, that, how to get us all through this uh, this bizarre moment in our history. That That's uh, very kind because I did get one uh, one message wishing me to be in hell as soon as possible. So I'd, I'd prefer not that to do that, but still, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and 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 please Professor be vaccinated. Thanks again. Thank please you. be vaccinated and please be safe. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much again for your time. Have a lovely weekend.